I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. Good morning. It is 9-13, Wednesday, May 26th. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by the J.P. Morgan Private Bank. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. So ready to get out of this Zoom purgatory. Back in the studio with you guys. I am Bill Finley, and I'm the vice president in charge of regional distribution of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And good morning, everybody. Good to be here. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And we are 50 days, 5-0 days from opening day at Saratoga. Mm, we might be there. Who knows? The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the J.P. Morgan Private Bank. J.P. Morgan Private Bank is a proud sponsor of the Writers Room. For over 200 years, we've helped successful individuals and families achieve their unique ambitions. To learn more about us and explore becoming a client, visit privatebank.jpmorgan.com. All right, so we have, we have some drama going on in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. We'll get to both. Uh, but we want to start with the situation that's going on at Monmouth Park. Uh, Monmouth is scheduled to open up this Friday, May 28th. Uh, and it's obviously a, a, a great meet that we all, being New York and New Jersey guys, we really appreciate the Monmouth and, and the, the atmosphere and, and everything that goes into that meet. But there's been some drama between the jockeys, track management, the New Jersey Racing Commission. John and I talked about this uh, on the Ocala show when it was first confirmed that the uh, the New Jersey Racing Commission's restrictive anti-whipping rules were going to go into effect. Um, and we talked about how we didn't think it was a great idea to not involve the jockeys in the decision-making process. And that's kind of what I want to focus on. I don't, you know, I don't want to get into the argument with Bill for the hundredth time about whether or not the whip is, is it should, should stay around regardless of where, where you fall on that issue. I think we can agree that it's, it wasn't a good idea to decree these rules from up on high with zero input from the guys who are actually on the backs of the horses. I personally think it's absurd. And I think the jockeys should have every right to boycott the track, even if they legally don't. Um, but I think the other thing is that this has put Monmouth in a really tough position. And it's not fair to Monmouth or Dennis Drazen to kind of make them the enforcement mechanism and or the, the guinea pig for the, the most restrictive rules in the country at a track that I think has, you know, relatively few days that they still run per week and seems to be struggling more and more to fill races and cards. Now on Saturday, on Friday, they do have six races, uh, 45 horses, 14 jockeys have agreed to run, uh, to ride. It's a little confusing what the, what's going to happen as the meet goes on. Now I know a couple guys are suspended. Nick Juarez is suspended. I think Farron Peterson is suspended. Paco Lopez has other commitments, so he's not going to ride there on opening day. And there was some talk about punishing jockeys who don't want to ride there on opening day to make a statement. I think Dennis Drazen has kind of backed off that a little bit. But I think the, the main point is that Monmouth was put into kind of an impossible spot here because why? I mean, the NJRC wanted to score some political points and make it look like they cared about animal welfare at a track at a place where uh, they, they let service in Navarro dominate for years and kind of ruin the racing product. So, you know, you know how I feel about it, but I just think it was kind of unfair to both the jockeys and Monmouth to put them in this position. It seems like it's going to be okay for now. We'll see how it goes for the rest of the meet, but Bill did some good reporting on this story yesterday. So I'm wondering his thoughts. Well, first of all, Joe, you're not entirely correct about this whole idea of the jockeys being completely left out of the process. Uh, when this thing was being put together last year, there was a New Jersey Racing Commission meeting where they could have come forward, had their say, talked in front of the entire commission. They chose not to show up. And I, I don't know why that strategy uh, is what they thought that was a good thing to do. But, but you're right. I mean, uh, it, it should have come down with more discussion from the jockeys. But however, one, another point I think people are missing is that even if the jockeys spent hours and hours and hours talking with them, pleading their case, they drew a line in the sand here. This was not going to change. No one was going to get talked out of putting this rule in. You can hate it all you want, but it's a, it's a fact. It's going to happen opening day at Monmouth, and it would have happened no matter what. So, you know, that's the, my first take on it. And, you know, I mean, obviously, we've got to come back to this next week because we'll do the follow-up. And that's what's really, you know, we only need this short sample of four days, I think, to make a uh, you know pretty good guess about how this is going to go. Uh, two things you do not want to happen. 
Obviously, number one is that there are any incidents on the racetrack where safety involved. Obviously, nobody wants that to happen. Obviously, everybody is concerned and cares about the safety of the jockeys. The other thing that you don't want to happen is a massive reduction in handle. Will people stay away from Monmouth Park because Joe Bravo is not riding and a guy on a seven horse is somebody you never heard of? Um, I, I don't know. That remains to be seen. I personally don't think handle will get crushed. Um, and he got a couple of nitwits on Twitter saying that they're not going to bet on Mammoth. Who cares? But I mean, it was the general guy and the, and the general man on the street, the, the everyday horse player, or even the big boys, too. Uh, are they going to boycott Mammoth? You know, I, I really tend to believe that's not going to happen. So, you know, I, I, obviously, we need to talk about this this week, but I can't wait till next week because then we'll f- finally be able to start answering some of the questions that have been raised by this. Mammoth Park has always been near and dear to my heart. It's the first racetrack I ever attended. Um, we were leading owners there for a number of years and, and consistently had it as our home base. And what we've seen over the past few years is that they're transitioning. Like most mid-level racetracks, um, they're transitioning because they're not owned by a, a super you know, publicly traded company. They're not owned by um, the Stronic Group. And, and really, they're kind of falling behind the other racetracks when it comes to handle and interests and overall prestige. Um, it's a beautiful racetrack, beautiful facility. And I still, again, love it primarily because it's been our home base for a number of years. But I think Mammoth has found themselves in a really difficult situation because they're not a super track where they can, uh, you know, bring in fans and top, you know, outfits and it, based on, on, you know, on history, based on the weather, like you do in Florida, based on history, like you do at Keeneland or, or Saratoga. So they're, they're kind of between and betwixt. So I understand their stance of, well, we need to make our racetrack look safer and try to do the right thing for the, for the horses. Um, and that's why primarily they've implemented this no whip rule. Whether or not it's really going to add to the, uh, to the safety of, the, uh, of racing, I, I don't know. I don't think any of us really know. I think from an optics standpoint, they felt like, this is the right thing to do because it's going to make it look like that we are doing something um, to help racing. And, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, my, my concern was, you know, just like we, you know, there, there's meetings that are, that are here in town and, you know, you kind of go and say, all right, well, I'm not going to attend this meeting because, you know, because of COVID or because I'm busy or because nothing ever really gets done at those meetings. I can't speak for the riders, but I, I fully intend, I fully think that, they probably looked at it and said, ah, it's another HPPA meeting. You know, why should we go? Um, and then I think they may have been a little surprised that that this was either on the docket or that this was talked about and implemented. Um, I, I still stand by that they should have had, even if they had the open forum in the meeting, that they should have at least reached out to the Jockeys Guild and said, hey, we're going to do this or we want to implement something for safety and for optics. Um, you know, we'd like to have your opinion on this because ultimately you are the driving force. You were the one on the, on the athlete's back. And we want to have at least kind of a formal union with the jockey guild of saying we collectively as the racing, uh, you know, um, executives and the jockeys collectively are putting this rule in place. And therefore there's more harmony. I think that probably in hindsight would have been a better um, opportunity. Maybe it's panacea and it, and it never would have gotten to that point. But um, I think if you're going to have, you know, people implementing the rule, i.e. the jockeys, you need to have them at least have kind of a voice or, or a seat at the table. Um, the, the, the one other thing in reading Bill's, again, excellent article, I'm not just saying that because you're here, Bill, but I, I really got a lot out of the, out of the piece, um, was that there was all kind of bluster from the racing office um, you know, from, from the general manager, from the, from the racing office, from Dennis Drazen saying, we're going to sue, we're going to sue. You're going to, you, you're going to find yourself out in your ass if you don't come in. And, and that's all fine. They, they, they can say whatever they want, but we've talked about this before, um, that jockeys are independent contractors. And if they don't want to ride, um, because they have a hangnail, they don't have to ride. If they don't want to come in because it's too cold or too warm or, uh, or, or, you know, or the bed is too soft or too hard and the poor just too, is, is, isn't just right, then that's their prerogative. They can absolutely do it. And as an owner, it drives me crazy because they do have the right to say, I rode your horse this time. I'm not going to ride it next time. Um, but they're under no obligation to show up and say that they want to ride or not ride um, at, your, at your facility. Um, and case in point, um, you know, the rider that won the Preakness 
you know, uh, uh, recently um, spun that horse and is now riding Hot Rod Charlie in the Belmont. So, you know, these guys are the epitome of independent contractors. So it, it, it's kind of a it's kind of a cluster right now um, that, that's going on. And I know the end result is, well, what are the fans going to think? And more importantly, what are the betters going to think? Um, and, and I really don't I don't think they care. I really don't think they care. They just want to see bigger fields and they definitely want to bet on races that have more than six or seven horses in it. Um, we've seen that statistically. Um, so I'm just not sure that that when all said and done, that that the whip rule is really going to make a difference to the end users, meaning the betters. John, it's too early in the morning for my head to explode, but here it goes. And I, I, you said a lot of things and I, that I, I want to talk about, but let's before we get any further with the train leaving the station here. And I don't know if you just misspoke or didn't choose your words carefully, but from if I take what you said verbatim, you, you made a mistake that a lot of people are making. This is not Monmouth Park. Monmouth Park has nothing to do with this. Dennis Drazen did not put this rule in and say they can't have jockeys. Excuse me, the jockeys can't have whips. This was done by the New Jersey State Racing Commission, and they are a separate body, and they're all powerful. Uh, Monmouth Park cannot possibly say, hey, we're going to go out and just ignore this. We're going to have uh, racing with whips. This is the new rule in New Jersey. And of course, Monmouth Park has no uh, option other than to you know, get on board with this. I just want to clear that up. And maybe even for the people that are watching this this time. And again, you see on Twitter all this chatter. Isn't it awful what Monmouth is doing? And a lot of people did bring up the fact that they let the two biggest rogues in horse racing over the last 25 years run amok at their track for almost a decade. That's a valid point as well. But remember, it's not Monmouth Park. You can't put the finger of blame. They, this is the last thing they wanted to happen. They want to go into the meet, have beautiful weather, no controversy, and have Paco Lopez win four races a day. Um, that they're not in that situation is obviously something that you know, despite all the bluster, Dennis Drazen at the end of the day never wanted to happen. So that's all. I just want to go on record. With yeah, that. no, I, Bill, I think I think that's fair, I, I, and I think you're right. It, it, it's it's not semantics. It, it, you're absolutely right. It, it's a matter of the New Jersey Racing Authority versus you know Monmouth Park. But I think that because Monmouth Park is really the only live racing racetrack in in the state right now, um, I would be shocked and perplexed that that the racing authority didn't reach out to Dennis Drazen, who is an attorney by trade, and say. Dennis, this is what we're thinking about doing. Um, you know, what are your thoughts? So even though I agree with you, Monmouth Park probably did not implement the rule. They definitely didn't implement the rule. It was from the racing authority. Um, I, I got to believe that they had some kind of back channel say in what was going on, or at least they were asked, what do you think about this? Um, you know, before they implemented this rule, because really, again, Monmouth Park's the only racetrack that's open right now for thoroughbred racing in New Jersey, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, there was one more thing. I mean, what you said, we don't know that. We yeah. don't know what they. No, no, it's all hyperbole. As a matter of fact, my guess would be that they didn't. They are, you know, they're the holy, higher than everybody else. And they're, you know, living on their mountaintop in Trenton, making the rules. And I don't think they necessarily. Well, we already know they didn't care what the jockeys think. Um, but I don't think they necessarily cared what Dennis Brazen. You know, they're above that. They are, you know, judge, jury, and executioner, and they're going to institute whatever rules they want. And at the end of the day, if you don't like it, then fine. Just go right at Delaware Park. You know, that, that's the kind of way it is. So, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I, I think you, you're uh, a little bit of a, a stretch to say, oh, well, why didn't Dennis Grayson and tell him this was a bad idea? Well, we have no idea if they consulted with him. And if so, what did he say? Right. I mean, that's why I, off the top I said that this is putting a myth in an impossible spot. If indeed that they, they didn't have any input on this rule, that this was just coming from up on high. and you know, John said something that, that I think crystallizes it for me, at least, is he said they wanted to make it look like they were doing something about race, about racing safety. To me, that's the whole thing. Like, this is a PR thing. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't, first of all, just to clear up for anybody, we've been talking for like 15 minutes, we haven't said exactly what the new rule is. The new rules are that, that you can't, you can't basically cannot strike the horse unless there is a safety concern, I guess. I don't know what exactly that entails, but I'm guessing if the horse is like bearing out to the outside rail or something, you can correct them. That's you can't use it the whip for motivational purposes. I, I honestly don't think that people don't realize how much the whip helps, especially for closers, especially for horses that are deep closers and need that kind of cue. Regardless, this is a PR thing. And I just want to know where was this energy? All these years from the NJRC 
when Jason Service and Jorge Navarro were completely dominating the Mammoth meet every year, flagrantly, allegedly, cheating and making a mockery of, of, a, of a great racetrack. And, you know, whether or not, I think you can argue that this makes racing less safe for both the jockeys and the animals because the, the riders have less control. We're going to see. We'll see about that. But this is this is a mess for Monmouth right now of the NJRC's making, regardless of where you stand on the whip issue. And it's it's going to be an experiment. You know, we talked about before that that Woodbine has new had, had uh, whip, new whip, whip regulations instated in the past couple of years. And Bill said that it didn't really affect handle. But that was different because that was, you know, underhand, overhand striking kind of thing like that's. I don't think in the end that that makes a ton of difference. This is going to make a big difference. And like Bill said, we're going to, we're going to follow up on this, on this next week and in the coming weeks, see how it affects handle, see if it, there are any, you know, incidents on the racetrack. We hope not. Um, but I, you know, at the end of the day, this is, I don't blame the jockeys for, for the way they feel because whether or not they had the, the opportunity to comment somewhere along the line, this is, I, I think that they, they, they're right to feel, kind of singled out the, the guys who, who ride at that racetrack other than a couple of them are blue collar jockeys. They're not millionaires. Like this is, this is kind of putting them in a tough position to be the Guinea pigs for this experiment that I think like, like John intimated is mainly a PR ploy. I don't think that this there's, I don't think there's any science that says that this is, this is going to make racing safer, but we're going to see. Joe, one thing before, I mean, I know we want to move on to some other subjects, but I mean, and again, this is not pro jockeys or anti jockeys, but I will say this much. They don't have a prayer. They have no leverage whatsoever, and they're not going to win this. So at the end of the day, the guys that are sitting out have to make a decision. Either ride at Mammoth and grit your teeth and accept this rule, or don't ride at Mammoth. We saw, and you're a little too young to remember this. I know John was the uh, inaugural Naira Mile back in what, the 88 or whatever uh, at uh, Aqueduct was run with, with substitute jockeys, where the entire, all the jockeys went on strike. And it was, it was very similar to what's going on now. You know, the main guys didn't want to ride. And then a couple of guys that win like one race a year said they would ride. Then people started to come in from out of town. But and I don't remember uh, exactly what that I know, but I don't recall ever writing because I was covering it for the New York uh, Daily News at the, that time. I ever writing that handle was down 50 percent or 40 percent because of that. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people that play horses are just kind of degenerates. They'll bet on anything. You know, they'll, if, if they don't have a card at Mammoth and they have cockroach racing instead. OK, well, say that. You know, Bill said that. I didn't say that. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> I agree. I agree with Bill, though, on this one. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> but 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 anyway, so and, and at the end of the day. Unless, uh, well, actually, even so, there is very clear New Jersey Racing Commission is not going to go back on this rule. They're just not going to do it. So at the end of the day, I mean, yeah, it's America. You have a right to just choose to ride where you want. Um, you don't have to show up at Monmouth Park. That's ridiculous for you know somebody to say, well, if, if the guy doesn't want to ride at Monmouth, that's one thing I definitely agree on. That whole thing about well, if a guy refuses to ride on opening day, he's banned. That, that was a really bad idea. And uh, it's it's very good that they're they're not going to go through with that. But at the end of the day, the jockeys need to look themselves in the mirror and say, where is this all headed? It's headed for a, for a strong defeat in favor of the New Jersey Racing Commission. You know, the, the only way you could really make a statement would be to have shut racing down. They're not, they didn't shut racing down for opening day. They're not going to shut racing down. And neither were their three horse fields. So, you know, let's again, I, I really look forward to coming back to this subject. But, you know, the jockeys uh, have to realize at the end of the day, they can't win. I mean, you, but you, you talked about a line in the sand. I think that's kind of what the jockeys are trying to do now, because they know this is an experiment in New Jersey that a lot of other tracks in the future may possibly adopt. And they're saying right now that this makes us feel less safe riding horses. And I have no problem with them drawing that line in the sand because at the at, like at, this is they are the the end user as john likes to say with with horses it's them and the horse once the gate opens nobody else has any say or any control whatsoever that's their leverage but like bill said you know they they didn't get enough guys to skip opening day to to cancel the the card so we're gonna see but i think that that they're right to say that this is to think that this is making them less safe and that this is an experiment for other tracks to maybe pick up on in the next couple of years, but we'll see. Yeah. And it may, it may turn out where it's an opportunity. I remember in the mid eighties where uh, there was a jockey strike at Monmouth and it basically launched the career of Chris Antley 
Um, it elevated the career of Julie Crone and, and CC Lopez, and, and they kind of never looked back because they stepped in and picked up mounts. Um, I'm curious to see how this guy, N Ryder, who's on a bunch of horses um, <laughs> in the in the overnight, does because he's on a bunch of horses. Uh, John, again, a bunch. He's on. Two, there's two horses in the entire card that don't have jockey's name. Don't say that. Don't say there's a bunch of horses. That's just oh, not true. You made that up, and you thought. Bill Finley would be sleeping the switch and wouldn't call you out on the entire card. Actually, three. One's and also a main track only is going to be scratched. Two horses in the entire card were named without jockeys. That is not a bunch. Come on. It, it was tongue in cheek, Bill Finley. Come Look on. Look at Bill back it that was, way. It was it came for a joke. It. This, this is the facts. There's the 800 horses that won't be ridden by jockeys. And, you know, uh, they're going to have to get the guy selling popcorn in the, on the third floor to come in and ride the horse in the fourth race. Oh, my God. What are they going to do? I That's know. The I know. I, is it is it that you're upset that that when they weighed the three of us, that, that at least two of us wouldn't have made weight to ride horses? Is that uh, why? You're, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. That, that was not ever going to happen. Trust okay. me. All right. That was also a joke, though. You know, that I really did. <laughs> I came across as a joke. You just need to work on your delivery a little bit there, John. Okay. I, I will take comedic lessons from you. Yeah. Back to you, John. And, and Henny Youngman, you're not. Exactly. <laughs> Oof. Bill is an aggressive fact checker today, and he's insulting the horse players. I didn't, you know, I, 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 I am one with the horse players. They are the most sophisticated of all gamblers. They smell great. They wouldn't bet on about anything. I'm with you guys. We'll see. We'll see what happens. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland, home of the world's yearling sale. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale beginning Monday, September 13th. Learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. Be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. This week's TDN Story of the Week is brought to you by the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. Find out how you can get involved in racehorse ownership at Canterbury Park this summer with several options and investments ranging from $250 to $10,000. Visit racehorseminnesota.com to learn more. All right, so the uh, the story of the week this week actually broke late yesterday, and we didn't have a ton to talk about this week, so thank, thankfully this broke. Um, parks, there was a raid on the on a couple of parks barns yesterday uh, orchestrated by the, the Pennsylvania Racing Commission. Uh, Bill reported on this. Um, it's, it was unclear which trainers specifically were rated, but there were a ton of scratches on yesterday's card at, at parks. Uh, Bill mentioned in the story, Richard Vega had a couple, had his horses scratched, not too familiar with him. Um, but, at, you know, this is, I don't know if anybody's ever seen that gif of, of Mel B, one of the judges on America's Got Talent, where she's like, yes, thank you. And that's like, that was, see, that you could tell, you could tell I'm a, you know, internet disease millennial, because I think in gifts now. And that's, that was the gift that I thought of immediately, because this should be happening regularly at every racetrack in America, investigations, at a competition testing, and raids, if necessary. And you know who does all those things? USADA. That's who, that, that's who specializes in that kind of stuff. So that, thank racing Jesus, that they are willing to come aboard and make this patchwork enforcement system into a cohesive network that actually removes cheaters across the country. And hopefully we can get that bill enacted on time because, you know, the fact is, even though I rail a lot about the decision makers and racing being complicit or asleep at the switch there, I think there are people in positions of power who are willing to do the right thing. But the thing is they're swimming upstream. The system itself is not set up for them to have actual enforcement power. And hopefully soon they won't be swimming upstream. They'll have a mechanism behind them in the industry that helps them do the right thing here. Now, this is, you know, I feel like this is a long time coming too for parks. And John talked about it. He's talked about it for, for, for weeks on his show about how he doesn't run at parks anymore because he feels like there are a handful of guys who are cheating. And, you know, it's just, it, it, 
there's not a level playing field. He feels like he can't beat those guys. And I think that that might, might have had an impact. You know, John is a, is a pretty big owner, especially relative to Parks. He's big in terms of horses, not stature. But he's he, he had <laughs> he, he but he has influence in the industry, and I think that that more owners would be wise to speak up and say that they're not going to run horses at this track or or in this state um, because they don't feel like they're, they're they're getting a fair shake. And I think Parks has has kind of had those problems for a while now, and maybe they've gotten worse over the years. I noticed in in the story that Bill wrote that uh, the guy from the Pennsylvania Racing Commission said that they're. Uh, enforcement kind of fell off because of COVID last year that they were starting to make progress in like 2019. And then last year they weren't able to do as much testing or investigating. Nevertheless, hopefully in the future, it will not, not won't be entirely out of their hands. It'll be in their hands at the ground level, but they'll have support from the higher levels in racing in order to do these kind of things. Bill, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, this, like the whip thing, this story will have legs because we, you know, we only know a couple of guys had their horse scratched on Tuesday, but we don't know who's involved and we don't know really what they found. So, and even to, even within the commission that the head of it, this guy, Tom Chukas is talking to all the commissioners. He's not even telling them everything. He said in this, uh, in the racing commission meeting, that this person, Catherine Papp, thank goodness, because otherwise nobody would have known about this, captured and put it on Twitter that, you know, an ongoing investigation, there's a lot of details uh, I can't give. So, who was involved? How many people were involved? And what did they find in the uh, in the raids is is obviously something that we need to know and, and will come out sooner or later. But Joe, back to your first point in that, you know, you're absolutely 100 percent right. Why doesn't this happen all the time? Why doesn't this happen? I mean, not every day, but maybe once a year at every racetrack in the country. We, I have you never hear about these things because I don't think they do it. So, you know, Pennsylvania came in, the COVID's uh, largely out of the way. We can come in and, and, and do our raids and pick back up where we left off. And lo and behold, yes, they found a lot of uh, bad stuff. So, you know, why isn't the Delaware Racing Commission uh, raiding Delaware Park? Why is the New York Gaming Association raiding uh, Belmont? I, you, know, I, you know, it doesn't have to be Elliott Ness coming in and the SWAT teams and everything like that. But, you know, this is obviously a tool that racing has that is underutilized. And if this was any other regulated industry, um, you know, the, the accounting industry, the financial planning industry, um, the, the medical industry, anything where a license is involved, you would see compliance reviews, spot checks, surprise audits. I mean, those are all tools that should be implemented. And I know this past year, and you guys alluded to it already, is that, you know, COVID kind of threw everything on its head and, and, and that, that kind of um, you know stopped and ceased and delayed a lot of these spot checks. Um, but every other industry that I know of that's regulated, where you have to get a license to be involved, has these kind of counterpoints and checks and balances um, in place. Um, you know, it, I was originally going to say even in prisons they they do, they do sell you know uh, shakes, but that that's not really that that probably wouldn't set the right tone. That's why I went with the more professional um, industries. Yeah, I don't it's good that you didn't say that. It's good that I didn't say that. I don't. I don't want to blur the line that that some of these guys are are alleged criminals that are that are you know handling horses. That I, that wasn't my point. My point is that no. My point is that regulated industries have checks and balances and audits in place um, to take care of this. So I am very very happy that Parks um, is you know did this. I am looking forward to them doing it more often. Try to level the playing field and hopefully you know if nothing else, even if it doesn't catch the, the people at least it puts a scare tactic into them that, you know what, tomorrow could be the day that they come in my tack room and look for syringes. Or, you know, next week could be the day that they look in my car because they have every right to and look to see if I have any unlabeled drugs that I'm bringing in or out of um, my barn area. When you, as a trainer, sign the uh, stall application, that's a legal contract. And in the contract, it actually says that you won't have contraband, um, you know, uh, in, in your in your tack room or in your um, facility. So, you know, right off the bat, if they find things that are considered contraband of any sort, they can kick your ass out. And, and that's, I think, what, you know, the racetracks need to continue to do. So, you know, on the one hand, as a cynic, I would say, geez, why aren't other racetracks doing this more and more? I'm looking at it as thank you, Parks. Thank you for doing this and hopefully continuing to do this more and more and more, because that is going to make things um, harder 
for people who want to bend the rules or break the rules um, to be able to do so. Um, you know, I'll be interested to see later on today when scratches come out for, for today's card at parks, if it's the same sus, if it's the same people, if it's, and, and we can say this because these people did have their horses scratched by the stewards, whether it was Richard Vega or Harold Wiley or a handful of other people, um, whether or not their horses that are entered today also are scratched by stewards. And then I think you're going to see a pattern um, that may be where there's smoke, there's fire. I'm not saying that those guys are cheaters. I'm just saying that for whatever reason, their horses were scratched by the stewards today, uh, you know, for yesterday's card. And I'm curious to see what happens for today. Um, as far as, as far as, you know, the, 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 the mantle, I appreciate you guys saying, Hey, you know, John, um, and other owners should speak up. And I, I fully agree with that. Um, I, I am not going to take credit for it. I think that this show is the megaphone and the mouthpiece for a lot of frustrated people in the industry. And, and Bill, you weren't there, unfortunately, in Ocala, but when Joe and I were walking around, we had a couple of people come up to us and say, thank you for being, um, Joe, what was the exact term? It wasn't the mouthpiece, but it was the conscience, the conscience, the conscience. of the industry. Thank you for being the conscience of the industry. And, and, and I, I know we all take that mantle very, very seriously. Um, we're all trying to make this industry better. We're all trying to make it, you know, my goal when I originally did the podcast was to make it less despicable. Now I want to make it better. Now I want to make it a better industry for people, for my friends and peers and, and uh, you know, other, other people who are interested in the game to come in and feel good about their opportunity to win a race or to, you know, even make money, God forbid, to make money in, in the business. But you have to start somewhere. And again, I can't thank Parks enough for starting and being at the forefront of this. Yeah, and it's and and make the industry less embarrassing. I think that that's that that's that's the main thing is that that every there shouldn't be in a, a a greatly embarrassing seemingly once in a lifetime story about the cheaters and racing every year. Like that's 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 kind of where we are now and yeah, I mean Parks, I, I think, has some cleaning up to do. I, I think overall is one of the tracks in, in America that kind of has has let things slide. And I don't know about let things slide, but the the product, I think, has gotten worse over the years. And it's gotten it seems a little bit like like the Wild West. And I think that that's backed up by the way. By the way, John described it when he said that he wasn't um, going to run horses any, any there anymore. But, you know, I I, I think that over over time even when they, these raids were done or there were, there were barn checks done. I've heard that a lot of times, you know, people from the, fr from higher up in racing will call the trainers and be like, Hey, we're going to come look at your barn. Like that's the opposite of what should be going on. It should be surprise raids and out of competition testing is a big thing too, because I think a lot of people feel that guys are juicing horses for training and then they can withdraw the drug in time for the horse to run in which case you're not catching the cheaters. And I think that they're usually ahead of the tests and the system in that way. So at a competition, surprise testing, it's a big thing in human sports to keep people honest. And it should be a big thing in horse racing as well, is that you never know when that test is coming. So you better be on your best behavior 365 days out of the year. And that's that's hopefully, I think, what's what's coming in the, in the next year or so with this new bill. Um, but I think Bill wants to follow up. Yeah, there's so much more uh, story that, again, things that we have to keep following. And this, I really, I say this almost with, uh, you know, with a little bit of, um, of a smile on my face because it's so ridiculous what I'm about to point out. But they said at this thing, basically, for the other two thoroughbred tracks in the state, Penn National and Prescott Downs, they basically told them, we're coming. We are going to come at your racetrack and do exactly what we did at Parks. Now, I, I mean, this is Joe, you can weigh in and... and um, uh, John, I mean, this will check the IQ of certain people in horse racing. Is anybody dumb enough if they raid, so they raided uh, parks last weekend, suppose they raid Penn National this weekend. Is anybody dumb enough to leave a lot of syringes and needles lying around? That'll be a good test of the collective stupidity of, you know, some of the um, uh, people in horse racing. So I'm really interested to see what happens in, in that. Because, I mean, talk about, you know, not trying to uh, camouflage what they're doing said, we're coming next to you, Penn National. We're coming next to you, Presque Isle Down. So that'll be interesting to see what happens from that. But I think, you know, uh, part, of the, part of the thing is deterrence. It's not necessarily 100% about catching cheaters all the time. It's about deterrence. It's about the planting the seed of the idea in people's heads 
that they could be knocking on the, my my door any day. They could be, you know, coming to test horses any single day. It's more about deterrence than necessarily catching every guy who's cheating because you're never going to be able to do that. It's about shifting the paradigm where guys no longer feel like they can get away with whatever because no, the, no one's going to punish them for it. So that's, that's a big part of it. We'll be right back after this message from the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. multiple great stakes winning resources like decorated invader is attainable with a racing partnership like west point thoroughbreds partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone this increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse learn more about why west point thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnership at westpointtv.com all right so i just wanted to touch on this real quick uh there was a there was a uh Quote from the CHRB last week um, that Baffert would not be suspended in California. Uh, PETA kind of latched onto it and, and you know, issued the scathing press, 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 uh, scathing press release that, you know, he's, he, they're allowing him to endanger horses, blah, blah, blah. They brought up the old story about uh, a bunch of his horses dropping dead in the early 2010s. Um, I don't I, I don't think this is, a, this is a huge deal. Their argument was that, you know, it wasn't the Kentucky Racing Commission or the New York State Gaming Commission that suspended Baffert at Churchill and Naira. Those were like individual uh, company, you know, you want to say ass covering moves, but but those were individual uh, kind of decisions by those racetracks, not from the actual regulatory bodies who were in charge of this. So they said that, you know, if there is another regulatory body that suspends him, then we will recognize that. But they basically kind of kicked the responsibility to the Stronic Group and Del Mar and Los Alamitos. And, you know, honestly, at this point, after all that they've allegedly let slide from Baffert over the years, I think it would kind of look ridiculous for them to take action now just because he, he failed a drug test in Kentucky. But the, th the thing I wanted to bring up and, and the question that I really have about this story long term is, you know, whether this will blow over for Baffert. And I don't think he's ever going to wipe this stain off from his legacy. But, you know, depending on what happens with Medina Spirit split sample and the investigation, quote, investigations uh, that are that are ongoing, will he be allowed by racing and the racing public to return to that perch that he enjoyed before as kind of the, the kingpin, the most decorated trainer in the game? So in other words, we know that there have been short term consequences in terms of him getting banned, at least temporarily at Naira Tracks and at Churchill. But will there be any long term consequences for the embarrassment that he brought to the sport? Or do you guys think that in a couple of months or maybe six months or a year's time, he's just going to be back to business as usual? He's going to have all his his high powered owners he's going to be winning everything all the time. Do you think that there is there are going to be long term consequences for Bob Baffert or will this blow over? Well, Joe, I think it'll personally, I think it'll come down to one thing, what Churchill Downs does. So let's right now he's banned, but it doesn't matter because he wouldn't be running in Kentucky this time of year uh, as is. So he right now he can't enter. He can't stable uh, at Churchill Downs. Come next year's Kentucky Derby. So let's suppose the split sample comes back positive. He will get suspended. I think it'll be 15 days suspension by the uh, Kentucky Racing Commission. And then, you know, Jimmy Barnes will show up as the train, trainer of record and everything, you know, yell all day long about what, what a bad system that is. But at least with male horses, virtually every owner who gives Baffert a young horse, these million dollar things bought at the sales, these homebreds by Into Mischief and Tappet and, and whatnot, with one thing in mind, winning the Kentucky Derby. So come the Kentucky Derby 2022, if Baffert is still not allowed to race at Churchill Downs, I think that'll be crippling to his career. If they do let him run and say, okay, you did your time, you did the 15 days, then I do think he has every chance in the world to be right back where he was before this uh, situation started. But another thing I'll agree with you, that doesn't mean the stain is going to be erased. This will follow the, the man to his grave. 
Yeah, I concur 100 percent, Bill. I think I think not only is it up to the you know the racetracks that are going to be pinnacle in in, in his uh, future um, resume, um, but also the owners. And we talked about it, you know, about Spendthrift making a, a bold move and and saying we're not only not giving new horses to you, we're taking horses away from you. Um, I think it's going to take more of the owners to make that conscious decision. And you have to understand that when people come into this business that are super successful in their own industries, um, there are very few things that, that cross over that they immediately you know, gravitate to. Um, and, and one is name brands. So you want to race at Saratoga, you want to race at Keeneland, you want to race at Santa Anita. And the other, you know, for name brands is trainers, um, because you want to go with the guys who have been to the dance before. And, and it's a prestige thing. They want to sit around and talk to their buddies and say, I have Todd Pletcher as my trainer. I have Chad Brown as my trainer. I have Bob Baffert as my trainer. Um, because all of them are, have, have, you know, excelled out of, our industry and their name brands. They people in the street know who those individuals are. Um, so new people who are coming to the business want to have something to hold on to. They don't understand pedigrees. They don't understand buyer numbers. They don't understand, for the most part, um, you know what, what they're looking at when they're looking at the athletes at a sale or in the paddock. So they have to be able to hold on to something. And name brand is what they're going to hold on to. So it, it's up to the owners. It's up to the owners to also make a conscious decision of saying. If I truly believe that Bafford is guilty of these sins, then I am not going to give him horses. If I don't feel, if I feel like he's being railroaded or he's not guilty or, you know, whatever, whatever, how you justify it in your mind, then they will give him horses and he will continue to do well um, because that's his primary goal is to run horses in the triple crown races. So I think it comes down to the racetracks and it comes down to the owners as far as what Bob Baffert's legacy is going to be going forward. Yep, as usual, those are those are the people that I think have have the most leverage. And the 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 brand name point is 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 a good one that I think people associate Baffert with the Derby and with the Triple Crown, and so they want to be part of that party. But guys, other guy, other trainers can get horses to the Derby and the Triple Crown. He doesn't train all twenty horses in the Derby. It's a self fulfilling thing where you know I'm not saying he's not a good trainer, but it's a self fulfilling thing where he gets all the best horses, so he's in the best spots. So it looks like he's a better trainer than everybody else. And he really is like top guy. There are a ton of top guys who can get you to the big races. So you don't have to put everything in Baffert's barn and be at risk of something like this happening and blowing up in your face. Joining the West Point Thoroughbreds Partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is the Managing Director of the J.P. Morgan Private Bank, our proud new sponsor. Thank you guys for coming aboard. Anthony Tremarkey, thank you so much for coming on. You got it. Thanks for having me, guys. So we're, we're super glad to have you and, and the crew on on board on this podcast. Uh, so I know that you're a relatively new guy to racing. Can you talk about how you first got into the sport and kind of how your interest has developed over time? Yeah, sure, Joe. So I was exposed to racing at a really young age because I grew up in Albany, New York, uh, just south of Saratoga Racecourse. And for as long as I can remember, probably every year of my life, um, you know, I spent a day at the races with my extended family. In the backyard, we used to hang out at the picnic area at the top of the stretch. And I still remember being a kid and loving going to the track for a lot of the same reasons I like it today. You know, it's an uh, amazing outdoor sport, beautiful horses, excitement, competition, crowds, numbers, colors. And, uh, you know, as, as I got older, I just kind of kept going. You know, I, I, I introduced a bunch of college friends to Saratoga. I had my bachelor party at the Traverse Stakes in 2010. 
Um, and as I got a little bit more older and a little bit more mature, I really um, grew to appreciate the history of the sport. You know, I, I didn't know a lot about that when I was younger. Uh, I didn't realize how special Saratoga was. I, I never went to another track until I was probably 25 years old. Um, so the history really kind of hooked me in. And, um, and also the numbers side of the game, you know, and, and handicapping. Um, I've always liked statistics. I like problem solving. I manage money for a living. And a lot of the concepts that I use in my day job, like trying to assign probabilities and trying to find value, you find in handicapping. And um, I found the intellectual stimulation of the sport to be like endless, right? There is so much information. You can't know it all. You can't always know what matters and what's noise. And, and so that, that kind of um, drew me in as I got a little bit older. Um, and, you know, fast forward to today, I, I've been involved on the ownership side for about five years. And it's all come full circle for me because I've taken my kids to the track. Um, I've got three elementary school age children who have all been in the paddock at uh, Belmont, Saratoga, and even Aqueduct. Uh, they've been in the winter circle at Oakland Park. And I just hope that they've got the same fond memories that I have from when I was a kid. And, and um, you know, it, it's one of my passions. It's, it's the kind of thing that I can't wait to make new memories with them over the next 10, 20, 30 years in the game. Hey, Anthony, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, over the last 10, 15 years, purses have exploded in this sport. I mean, we're seeing a maiden special weight races and allowance races at Churchill Downs worth $100,000. Uh, you know, the, I don't know if have an exact figure, but I think purses have easily doubled, if not tripled, over that uh, period of time. So logically, the rule, normal rules of economics, the full prop should be going up. There should be more owners getting involved in the game all the time. Neither is happening. Matter of fact, the opposite is happening. And what's your take on that? Why, why from an economic standpoint, are these things out of whack? You know, I'm, well, I'm in some ways kind of preaching to the choir because I'm in. Um, and I know a lot of people like me who I've met who, you know, we all kind of happen to have Wall Street careers. And I think there's definitely overlap with the sport and, and that profession just because of the numbers and statistic as, aspect of things. But I don't know. I, I kind of looked at it as like a value opportunity that, you know, there are not a lot of people coming in. Um, you know, I have a friend who I've been talking to for months. We were trying to claim a horse at Fairgrounds or Oaklawn to run it. Uh, Arkansas and qualify for the shipping bonus to Naira. Like, I don't know how many people are out there doing that, but I, I think there has to be an opportunity for people like me who want to get in the game. The purses are attractive. Um, if you structure it the right way and have the right partners, you know, I happen to work with the green group and Jim Bankoil. Um, you know, the, the, the tax treatment makes the business plan a lot more attractive. And, uh, you know, I'm in, I think everyone should do it. I'm, I'm proud to be around the sport. I, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's not as big as it was in the 70s racing as, as it relates to the rest of professional sports. I think what's happening with racing on TV and the Fox Sports broadcast will hopefully change that. I know I had a bunch of people ask me about racing last year when we were the only sport on TV. Um, but, uh, you know, I agree with you. The purses are attractive. The business, you know, aside from the business aspect of it, and, you know, it is a business for me and I, I, I operate that way, but the shot of adrenaline that you get leading up to a race or when you win a race, like if I could put that in a bottle, I mean, I'll, I'll be chasing that the rest of my life. And, and so I think if we could get more people to the track, I know for me, like the first time I, I had some, I've got some clients who are pretty serious horse owners and I got to experience ownership through them. And the first time I was in the winter circle, like I decided I was going to own a horse. And so I, I think it's, it's just all about exposure. And Anthony, one of the things that, that JP Morgan Chase has that's very unique is this lending program, um, which would enable people to be, you know, buy any kind of horse asset um, that that's out there. Could you give us a little bit of background or, or insight as to that unique program? Yeah, sure, John. So I um, I run a team here in Greenwich, Connecticut, where I'm sitting uh, for J.P. Morgan Private Bank, where we work with wealthy individuals and families, uh, and, and we help them with all their personal financial needs, which to me is all about uh, banking, access to credit and liquidity, which John, you mentioned, money management. And also we do a lot of um, pretty complex, but, but, but important tax and estate planning work. Um, the probably like to the people that know what I do, but aren't in the industry, the biggest thing they're surprised about is, is that wealthy people borrow money. Um, people think, well, you know, why would they do that? Um, but actually there's a lot of really interesting reasons to do it. Tax efficiency, liquidity. Um, and uh, most of my clients 
own a business, run a company, are running a horse business, are heavily invested in real estate, like they have some concentrated asset or business that they're invested in. And they feel more confident in that than anything else that I could ever do with them. And and sometimes it's really attractive to have access to liquidity to bridge a gap or to to make a purchase or you know to, to kind of bring it back to the thoroughbred industry. I watch, um, you know, just like I'm tracking trends and values in the market, um, you know, I watch the sales. I, I, I've bought three fillies at auction over the last two years. I'm always kind of trying to see what the trend is and where there's value. And, you know, think about the two-year-old sales we've had this year so far. They were really strong. If you wanted to buy a horse and you thought you were going to pay 100 grand or 250 grand, like you probably had to pay up 50% more to, to get that horse bought. And I think it's really logical to expect that trend to continue into the yearling sales later this year. And so now is kind of the time to start thinking about liquidity and dry powder. Um, And the big benefit of having a commercial bank balance sheet behind me and my clients is that, um, you know, we do a lot of traditional forms of lending, but we can also be really creative and look at balance sheets and and find the smartest, lowest cost and most tax efficient way for clients to to, um, have liquidity to buy the property or buy the horse that, that they really have their eye on. And, and Anthony, just as a follow up, what, what is the, the procedure if somebody wants to, um, you know, have money to, uh, to uh, you know, to access for the upcoming sales or to even claim a horse for example? Yeah. Yeah. So best thing is to, you know, honestly reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the industry. I understand the sport. Um, and, uh, you know, I think sometimes money managers and CPAs, when they hear horses, they probably run away. Uh, I, I get it. I understand how it works. Um, and I'm also a straight shooter. You know, if, if, if I'm not the right person or we can't get something done, I'll, I'll be upfront about it. But um, it's really give me a call, have a conversation. Um, you know, we, we, we're, not, uh, we're, we're not saying we lend to everybody, but, you know, I think we can be creative and smart in the right situations with the right clients who we want to work with and want to work with us. And uh, you know anybody in the industry that that needs help or that this sounds interesting to, they they should give me a call. This kind of follows up on on, on Bill's question a little bit. I think you're the kind of guy that that we're trying to get into racing. Younger guy who's with a little bit of disposable income who is passionate about the horses and got got bitten with the bug. Now, as a younger guy in the in the industry, I try to kind of you know tell people, tell my friends, bring them into the industry, tell them why I love it. Here, come to the track with me. What do you think the industry is missing to bring guys like more guys like you into the game? Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think it's it's the right places, right? It's either track on a big day or Saratoga or Keeneland, um, even Oakland. You know, Oakland Park. I've, I've grown to love because I've um, I'm a partner with Ten Strike Racing. I have been for five years, and and we run a lot of horses in Arkansas. There are certain tracks and certain meets that are just exciting, and I think. You got to bring people to those meets. Um, I don't know what else it would take. It's it's awareness. You know, I, th- I think people need to understand that this is out there and understand what it looks like. I know for me, um, you know, I saw the sport through clients who were major owners that had dozens of horses running all over the place. I didn't understand what entry would look like. You know, I, I thought it was the kind of thing that you needed to be a billionaire to do. And it's it's not right. I mean, it's it's the kind of thing that it requires some disposable income, obviously, but you can do it responsibly and get exposure. And, you know, I'm a great example of this. Like I, you know, I started out doing small syndicate stuff. I saw, I saw the sport, I saw the risk, I understand it. And I, and I decided I wanted to do more and I wanted more control and action. And um, I think it's, it's just trying to find ways to get people exposed. I wish I had a better answer. No, I mean, I don't have a better answer. That's why I asked you. I ask everybody this to see what they think. Yeah, I mean, look, like I'm, I'm not shy about it. Like, I, it, it's on my professional bio that I own horses. Um, I just joined uh, about a year and a half ago the uh, board of trustees for the Backstretch Pension Trust in New York. Like, I'm proud of this, and I want, um, you know, I'll probably put this uh, podcast on YouTube on uh, LinkedIn. Like, I, I want my friends and colleagues and clients uh, to know that I'm doing this and. And hopefully by, you know, having smart, reputable people like the four of us um, involved with the sport, you know, that, that, that just helps the, the reputation and the awareness going forward. Yeah, I mean, we're all, we're all representatives of the industry. That's, that's one of the things I've learned over time as well. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, Anthony, one more for me. And could you speak to this? Why is racing a good opportunity for your company? So I think personally, there's probably no 
you know, JP Morgan Private Bank um, has has had differing different marketing approaches over the years. Um, you know, we have a you know a pretty high end client base, and we haven't wanted to just market everywhere. We were very selective about where we wanted our brand. Um, and we in the last couple of years we started, um, you know, putting ads in some financial publications that have a readership base that looks a lot like our clients. And I think there is probably no audience that overlaps with my clients more than the horse industry, um, whether it's owners, breeders, um, you know, trainers, jockeys, like, you know, there are people in this industry that um, look like the clients I want to work with. And, and, um, and like I said, I'm, I'm really proud to be involved with the sport. And that's, that's why I've, I've been talking to TDN for probably five years about trying to make something like this happen. And, um, you know, we're just delighted to, to finally get it done. And Anthony, last one for me, um, you know, I, I know I found when, when I was building my financial planning firm um, and overlapping in the industry that, that being at the sales, being at the races, um, being able to talk to talk to people is, is probably the most important thing that you can do. Um, give our audience an opportunity to, to know where you're going to be this summer or, or how accessible you are, because um, it's one thing to call somebody, but it's another thing to kind of, you know, share ideas over uh, an exact box in the, in the fifth race at Saratoga. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'll be, um, I, I plan to be at the spa for most of the meet. Um, you know, I, I rented a house and worked up there last summer, but I won't, I probably won't do that this year, but, um, most weekends, um, as much as I can, I've got a couple of weeks blocked off. Um, we'll definitely be up there for Whitney weekend in the Saratoga sale. Um, you know, I, I, I've been a pretty consistent presence up there. I haven't, I haven't bought a horse at that sale. I don't think I will anytime soon, but, um, I'll be there. And so, um, if anybody wants to, um, to get together, meet up, you know, we could do it at the sale. We could do it at the paddock bar. Um, you know, I, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to, to make that happen. And uh, it will be up there. So we'll definitely get up with you for sure. No doubt. So, no doubt. Anthony, thank you so much for the time. Thanks for coming aboard. It was great to talk to you. You got it guys. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. Great job. And Anthony. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Anthony Tremarkey will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writer's Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. All right, so before we get out of here, I just wanted to kind of run down the weekend's big races. Didn't have a lot of great racing action last weekend after the Preakness, but this week we have Memorial Day weekend. We'll have stakes action Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to pay attention to starting Friday at Penn National with the Penn Mile card. Penn Mile has kind of grown in importance over the years. It's a grade two now. Uh, notably, uh, Lau Ben, who unfortunately passed away earlier this week, is one of the up-and-coming sires in Kentucky. He'll be represented by the King Cheek in that race. Uh, we also have the Penn Oaks that night as well. Um, Saturday, we have the Matt Wynn, which I know John will be represented in, and, and I'll toss to him in a second to talk about that. Uh, we also have the Penine Ridge at Belmont, so a couple of three-year-old races there. Uh, at uh, San Anita, we have the Charlie Whittingham, the Daytona and the Triple Bend, so a couple of great stakes there. Um, and then Monday is, is a big card at San Anita, where they have the Grade 1 Gamely, the Grade 1 Hollywood Gold Cup, and the Grade 1 Shoemaker Mile, so that's a big card on Monday at San Anita. Also, the Steve Sexton Mile at Lone Star, I don't want to leave that out. It looks like they're going to they're gonna get a pretty good field in there. And overseas, there's the Japanese Derby late Saturday night into Sunday morning. So I'll keep one eye on that as well. But John's got a, the, the show horse, the podcast horse, Helium, at least until Writer's Room runs. Helium is the podcast horse running in the Matt Wynn. I know Cattle River's in there too. What, do you, what are your thoughts, John? No, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, usually the Matt Wynn historically is, is uh, comprised of, you know, two or three horses that come out of the Derby, a horse that, that hits the board or close to it in the Pat Wynn. 
and then a couple of other horses, um, you know, that, that come into town for the race. Uh, you know, the nice thing about it for us was that we didn't have to go anywhere. We just, we've had the uh, helium at trickle downs for a number of weeks now. We've been able to train on that home course. Um, I think the, uh, the horse to beat is Cattle River, who ran second in the Arkansas Derby. Um, there's a lot of speed. Uh, you know, surprisingly, of the six horses that are in here, you know, three or four of them love to be on the lead, whether it's Boca Boy coming in from Florida um, or Hello Hot Rod, who, uh, you know, may be coming in from uh, his fourth place finish in the Tessio. Um, but the, the other big horse, I think that, that may be a, a real competitor in, in, in the race is Obesos, um, who is owned by, you know, West Point Thoroughbred, sponsor of the show. Um, who put in just a massive run in the Kentucky Derby. And I, I think I'm equally as concerned about Caddo River as I am about Obesos in this race. And I think it's it's, it's kind of interesting uh, that it, it did get, get a pretty good feel with the Belmont being the following week. And it's usually, I feel like those races kind of clash, um, but I think you're going you're gonna to see top quality three-year-olds in both of those races. I think it's a, it's a wide open three-year-old division right now, man, especially with the, the drama circulating around Medina Spirit um, obviously, Round Bower is impressive in the Preakness, but I think there's a, there's still a lot to be decided in the three-year-old division the rest of the year. And I think the next two weeks might give us a little bit of clarity, at least going into the summer. So best of luck to John and Helium this Saturday. We'll obviously be pulling for you guys. Um, unless I need, like, I know, Bezos, Helium Exactor or something. Then I'll be rooting for you to run second. But, you know, for, for now. A close we're... second. A very close second, right, John? Second. No, no, we, we hope you guys get the job done. And then we'll, we'll, I assume we're going to see him in grade one company after that, as long as he runs well. So look forward to that. Look forward to the stakes action this weekend, particularly at Santa Anita. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up next week. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I wanna see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can, because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. All right, so that's gonna do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by the J.P. Morgan Private Bank, a proud sponsor of the Writers Room podcast for over 200 years. They've helped successful individuals and families achieve their unique ambitions. To learn more about them and explore becoming a client, visit privatebank.jpmorgan.com. I wanna thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Anthony Tremarkey, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Ritz, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Ali LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.